So episode two, we're following the Cali cartel, not Cali, California. This is still in Colombia. It's a city in Colombia. And it's so interesting. In episode one, we got this great character of Pablo Escobar and we see this incredible story. And I love on this episode, we see that story from a slightly different perspective and we get that story fleshed out more. We find out that this Cali cartel actually worked with the government to bring down Pablo Escobar and was crucial in actually providing the information that got him killed, which is fascinating. And they say it's because Pablo Escobar threatened them when he was at the, the height of his craziness and the violence. But you wonder how much of it was their fear and wanting to protect themselves and how much of it was their greed because once he was gone, they would step into the big role. And I really liked how they showed how they started out just with these small scams selling regular water as holy water and then progressing up to insurance fraud where they had a pharmacy and they would, I assume, take all the expensive items that they could sell on the side and then burn the pharmacy, get the insurance money, and things escalated and escalated. Eventually, they would do the same thing. And it's interesting, we saw in the first episode how they would load up the planes with cocaine, just drive them into the ocean, and then just get the drugs out and just leave the plane there because they were making so much money, the plane was inconsequential. And we see that in this case here, they would fly the planes right into somewhere in the United States and then just leave the planes because they were making so much money, a million dollar plane was nothing. And we get this great quote that cocaine was their business, but power was their drug. And it's so interesting that anytime you have people and organizations competing for power, information gathering and having information is always everything. So we see these drug cartels using the exact same methods as the CIA or any intelligence agency. They do wiretaps to try to find out where their rivals are going to be so they can assassinate them. They try to get inside people to feed them information especially on the police so they know when there's going to be raids and we get this great truth is stranger than fiction moment where he's hiding in the secret compartment and the cops are closing in on him and they have the drill and they're drilling into his compartment and he sees the drill going and they're about to catch him but then the captain the police captain goes and stops the other cops because he's corrupt and he's on the take and he gets away and it's just who would think that, you know, this big cartel leader, he's about to get captured, he's literally inches away, and a crooked cop steps in and saves them. It's like a TV show. Now for episode three, we get a total change of vibe. We, we were in the 80s with Reagan, the DEA, Florida, partying, cocaine. Now we move back to the 60s and 70s. We get a lot of black and white shots, and it's a more mellow Harlem, New York culture, and now we have a new drug, heroin. And we're following Frank Lucas, and this is a guy, he's giving interviews, and even when he talks about things like murder or, cu or cutting people's drugs, he's still likable just from the way he talks. So at first he's getting heroin from the mafia, but eventually he decides to get involved with the people over in Vietnam during the Vietnam War, especially this guy named Sergeant Smack. And it's just fascinating, I had no idea that during the Vietnam War, people saw it as this opportunity to utilize the people coming back to bring drugs in, and of course they would. And people say that they used to smuggle the heroin inside the coffins of the dead Americans coming back and their body bags. So you think of this imagery of people coming back from the war and all these dead bodies coming back, but then also in the coffins, even more death and destruction in the form of the drugs. So just this darkness seeping into the country. And they say that wasn't enough. They would actually sow the drugs inside the bodies of the dead soldiers and then certain funeral homes they would send these body to, bodies to and the morticians would open them up and take out the drugs. So now Frank Lucas is getting this really pure product from Asia, he calls it blue magic. And it's interesting because whenever we think about overdoses, a lot of times people say, well that's drug dealers cutting their drugs and putting other stuff in it and that's what causes overdoses. But it's actually the exact opposite a lot of the times that people are used to getting cut drugs that aren't as strong if they ever did get a pure version of the drug or something that was more pure and they would take the same dose, that's what would cause the overdose. So in some sense, cutting your drugs as a drug dealer in a weird perverse way, it's almost necessary to prevent overdose. And it's always great to see what mistake brings down these drug lords. And in Frank Lucas's case, they made it seem like wearing this chinchilla suit, this ex extravagant suit and going out to to the game and getting photographed, that was what brought him down. And of all the things, you know, a chinchilla suit, but that's what he was and that's what he wanted to be. He didn't just want to be powerful, he wanted to enjoy his power as well. 
And then the documentary says that he went to a witch doctor and the witch doctor told them, don't worry, you're going to win in court, which ended up actually being kind of true. And that's why he decided to take it to trial and not take a deal. And he ends up getting a 70 year sentence reduced down to five. And a lot of people think he obviously informed and gave information and that's why. And he denies it. So you don't know if it's true. But I think what's interesting is for a lot of other people, even the suspicion that they ratted would get them killed. But when you're the boss and you achieve a certain level of power and influence, either people don't want to believe it and they don't want to believe that you could rat and that gives you some kind of immunity to actually give information or you're just so powerful and you're able to make people so much money and you're so dangerous that it doesn't matter. You can inform and like they say, he kept doing what he was doing. He got another seven year sentence after this. So he kept operating even after there were these rumors that he took a deal and evidence or strong hints that he took a deal, but he was still able to operate and go to prison and he's still around to this day. So when you're on top, there's an immunity from almost anything. And in this chapter, it was interesting. They tried to make the cops seem cool and they gave him a special name, the Z team. And I thought it was, it, I liked the effort in a lot of TV shows and movies they do make the cops seem cool and glorify the cops, but in documentaries, the cops and the journalists who cover these guys and try to catch them, they don't really get a lot of attention. The news and documentaries seem to give a lot more attention to the actual criminals. So this episode, at least, trying to make the cops seem cooler, giving them the fun name, it didn't work, I don't think, but it was an interesting effort. And then for episode four, we're over in Australia. There's this crime family. It starts with Kath, and she's the mother. And it's always interesting to see where they get their start. She got her start in massage parlors with happy endings. Eventually, she gets into BDSM stuff with her clients at the massage parlor. Eventually, she becomes a madam, opens her own massage parlor. It's always interesting to see how they develop. And it was so unsettling because she's, at this point, an old woman and, you know, she's talking about all these things she did in her youth, and it's kind of creepy. And then her and her sons start trying to build this drug empire, and it's so interesting to compare it to the other three stories we've seen, where there are these big cartels and gangs, and it seemed very sophisticated at times, very intricate. In this case, it was different. It seemed kind of trashy and low-level. Like, at one point, one of her sons wants to delay the court proceedings, so he keeps going to the bathroom to puke. And eventually the judge won't let him go to the bathroom anymore. So he actually forces himself to puke right there in the courtroom. And just the stench just horrend bothers everyone. So he actually gets his delay. And it's just those little scummy tactics like that. But they were huge. And they were this huge crime family. And you start to see the difference between the different drugs and the vibe they have. So he gets into meth. And he's constantly has his arm tourniqueted so he can just inject constantly and have the veins showing and he gets paranoid and he's constantly looking out the walls, uh, looking out the windows for cops, watching him staying up for days on end, torturing people in his bathroom, and you just get this meth dealer vibe. And the difference between someone like Pablo Escobar, who the police never knew where he was, and he was such an elusive figure, versus him, he's always in contact with the police, and he's always barricading his house, so it's going to take the police 15 minutes to get in there, and the police will do a raid, but it takes him 15 minutes to get in, so he can just flush all the drugs, and there's just these constant raids where he'll hide the drugs in the next door property. So he'll just bury the drugs one house over and they'll find the drugs and they can't pin it on him because technically it's not his property. So he'll just lose a bit of drugs and just this constant low level war with the police where they're in constant contact with each other. And he becomes a big informant for the police. And it's interesting, out of all the stories that we've heard, the only story where we didn't get any sense that was Pablo Escobar where it didn't seem like he ratted on any other criminals. The cartel that was his rival ratted on him in episode two. Frank Lucas, they said, ratted on people to get a reduced sentence. And then here he ratted on people to keep the police from, you know, arresting him and try to, you know, continue to operate. So it's interesting that Pablo Escobar, the only one we didn't see really do that. And then eventually he starts having heart trouble and what's interesting is one, now that he's weak and people don't fear him actually coming to their house and killing, killing them, everyone starts to come out of the woodwork and accusing him of murder. And then also since he was such a presence in his organization with his family and other people, that once he eventually dies of this heart problem, 
the whole organization collapses in a way that I don't think other cartels and other organizations would have. But with him, he was such a presence and there was really no second in command, no third in command. It was all about him that with him died the organization as well.